here. At the UN Office of the High Commissioner of He was also a journalist and lawyer and the co-founder of the Center for Legal Action for Human Rights. As you know, he's one of the most society. However, it requires modern infrastructure. It calls for strengthened institutions, a citizen equipped with the skills, attitudes, urging social vision that encompass plurality, inclusion, solidarity, participation, and respect for human rights. UNESCO in India has been working with various partners in the field of education, culture, sciences, information, and communication to promote peace and sustainable development. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development creates a new context for action with the slogan of no one left behind. Knowledge societies and digital empowerment are essential for their realization. However, these innovations can also deepen existing inequalities and create new ones leaving behind. Disaster prone areas, ethnic and linguistic minorities, and other marginalized groups in all societies. So, we cannot just invest in technology or give free reign to innovation, rather than we must consider and address their ethical and societal dimensions. These we will now I'd like to invite Cole on the flank to deliver his closing keynote address. After his the keynote address, if time allows, I will open the floor and then invite your question and comment. Frank, please. Thank you very much. Thank you for this introduction. Um, it's always a pleasure to be with our regional offices, and in this case with the office of Delhi that covers six different countries. But also thank you very much to the organizers of ICEGOV in 2000 us as UNESCO again to participate with you. For us, it's a big honor uh, to be able to share our views as UNESCO in this particular uh, venue and in this particular... As you all know, years before the Universal Declaration for Human Rights was drafted, UNESCO was established in 1946, right after the Second World War. And the main purpose of UNESCO was to search for peace in the world by developing peace in the minds of individuals, it said, in the minds of people, because it is in the minds of people where war is to policies of education, of culture, of science, of social sciences, and of communication and information, which are the issues that UNESCO works in the, the, still today. Now, for us, all those issues are related. We live in a multicultural world, and we live in a world that desperately needs education for children. And we live in a world where scientific research is important for development. But we also need, live in a world where enhanced communication is fundamental for all those other elements. And especially in this guarantee to involve expression for the Human Rights Council, we used to and talk about the fact that freedom of expression in a way is our process of mind, of building our minds. Because it is the right you exercise in two di dimensions. It is the right to seek and receive information, as well as the right to impart information and to share an in between that information there was another process which was building your mind freely, the freedom of opinion and the freedom of thought. 
And this was very important because if we look at it, whether it was individually or collectively, this is the way we always constructed our knowledge. So we can talk about knowledge of individuals since our earliest ages, but we also can talk about the knowledge of societies, build knowledge societies. The fact that we guarantee building the opinion of those that design policies and sharing publicly our opinions and our criticisms when those are and the ice or sharing information can happen is geometrically all the time. So we cannot conceive of anyone today seeking information, investigating, studying, documenting, or even sharing news every day without digital technology. Building networks, establishing sources of communication. But the plans of development of our societies were linked intrinsically to the possibilities of that communication happening. And this is why today we talk about building knowledge societies based on the access to information. And to make it more simple, in the last agenda established last year on the SDG, which wanted to amend the millennium development to be more effective, more inclusive, more sharing, that were equal nations, they, there was a particular emphasis on the fact that these goals can only be reached, number one, to the extent that they are known and assimilated by everyone. In the UN, all the way to the cabinet members and maybe to some leaders in different countries. But it was very difficult to find even mayors in small little towns that knew about the Millennium Development Goals. Today, the purpose is that the SDGs them, but for the, most importantly, for the sake of implementing them. And this means a permanent flow of information. Not only a one-time information, not only sensitizing initially about the goals, it means giving the permanent flow that all 17 goals need. And it's also why in goal 16, it took them a long time to decide this goal, which is one of the reasons why it was left to the end, but in goal 16, development, we must build societies in peace, Inclusiveness, no one must remain out of the plans, with access to justice, with transparency, and public access to information. All I've been listening to in the last two days here in the different panels, it speaks different languages, has different cultural and religious backgrounds, and we must be able to understand each other, but also to understand the goals that we have traced for the world. But we must also be inclusive, inclusive to allow all minorities, all groups, all ethnic groups, all linguistic groups participate. We must allow people with disability to access yeah. the justice, which is a fundamental element for the building peace. We must build transparency. Just when we were listening to the plenary session of this morning, everyone was saying one of the biggest obstacles for development is the lack of efficiency or corruption. And we must be able to combat that. And we must be able or local level. This is important. And finally, we must give all access to the public, which is the goal 1610, guarantee public access to information. It turns out that information is the fundamental element of the we talk about is that government not only information but also access to services and access to different policy debates and to decision making process and why are we linking this to human rights and democracy at this moment is because democracy means a democratic democracy means democratic institutions that are solid and that respond to the principles of the constitution democracies need some form of electoral process to guarantee clear representation. But more importantly than all these conditions, democracies need participation of citizens. This is the fundamental level. And participation of citizens alternatives to communicate the will of the people all day, every single day that the governments are implementing policies. 
So when you establish this form of government, when you establish a possibility that a, that a public policy is going to be debated openly, or when you establish a possibility of drafting a budget and doing a participatory budget, exercise human rights. Human rights is not something very distant and ideal, as people used to tell me before. Human rights is something that we must make a reality every single day, at every moment, with every decision that we make, and the possibilities of engaging those rights by establishing clear development goals. And this, in these three days, you're building what will be the new model of democracy in the future which will have, yes, a legal framework, will have electoral processes, will have strong institutions, but essentially you're building a new system that through these new means of communication is trying to guarantee inclusivity in all our nations around the world. Congratulations for your work and thank you very much for having inviting UNESCO to participate. Be the really, really the foot for foot, foot for foot for us to bring the our own the places. Well, the Europe is strong. The what is the democracy? It's a model of the participation of the citizens. The question is the e-governance can provide all these opportunities equally to the citizens. And uh, you also mentioned something about how technology can contribute to achievement of SDGs and also the, how the communication technology can be used by the people for the building the peace, peaceful societies. Question is, working in this country already five years is the, the gap between haves and haves not. If you look at education, we still have the some 300 million people who cannot read and write in this knowledge society. And we have huge population school going age kids do not go to schools. And technology and information. Well, the, having said this, I'd like to, we have some 10 minutes to go, so that we drag, I would like to open the floor and then the invite some kind of questions and comments from the floor. Everybody seems a little bit exhausted after very deep deliberations of the two days. Yes, I saw the hand of this gentleman, please. Oh, oh, sorry, the, this gentleman first and come to you. Hello, I am Rajneesh. We are talking about e-governance, e for electronic governance, e for equality, but we According to me, a lot needs to be done on this because in India, some college students, youngsters have been arrested by police where they have just put few posts. That means that I feel. Thank, thank you for your comments. I would like to also invite a couple of the question comment and then the Come back to Frank. No, I need uh, that gentleman first. Uh, privilege to listen to a historian as well as an EGAV freak. So, and looking back to 46, and I was born in 47, so it's not far away from that, um, I can see there's been tremendous progress. And, and even in, the, in, in all the issues you mentioned, and even in the last 15 years, all the reasons, uh, violence is lo less, crime is less, education is higher, etc., etc. But there are ups and downs. Uh, and, and the internet and all technologies are, at this present time, being seen as a means to corrupt some of the political processes, maybe distort the public debate, um, the very opposite of the way they should be used, one, one would argue. But technology is a tool and it can be used and misused. 
So uh, your comments on that would be very welcome. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure they're going to be optimistic because it was an optimistic speech and I'm optimistic. <laughs> in New York. Um, my question has to do with uh, the next generation. So as we think about um, an environment like here at ISCOV where we bring together academics, we bring together practitioners, um, and we think about and new public policy can be brought together to expand uh, the potential uh, of, uh, of uh, our societies to, to meet the sustainable development goals. So in the nutshell, what advice about uh, capacity building and the formal education? On this first round, we'll the, after three questions, I'd like to invite Frank to respond to these very variety of questions. propose myself to give that with every technology and technological development, we always have challenges. Technologies are a wonderful leap in history for different generations according to when a particular invention occurred and when it was put to use. But every time there was no technology developed or something new was invented, there was always challenges of using it well or not, whether it be dynamite or whether it be machinery for the Industrial Revolution or whether it be the radio frequencies or, or all those different elements that were discovered. In the internet is not... In, in is that before all communication was in a single direction from a communicator point to people that were the audience, whether one or several individuals. And this could be interactive form of communication. We have one person that is the communicator, and in real time, all those that receive that can respond and interact, can interact themselves, or can reproduce that information and develop broad networks with other people. So it's this very interactive nature of internet that all of a sudden changed the dimension. Any research has to have the support, it doesn't necessarily mean it cannot be done in other ways, but support of some forms of internet communication for being able to be efficient. But at the same time, we have to recognize that we're dealing with big problems and big pitfalls and dangers that go from cyberbullying to precisely the digital divide. And now that we're celebrating yesterday the International Day of Women, for instance, one of the big also had a bigger digital divide for minority languages and minority script, which is also a problem. Or we also have a challenge in terms of education internet is making us reflect upon this. It's also making us reflect on other problems, cybercrime that was mentioned by the first uh, uh, question, or I could say incitement to racism that is happening today in the world, or to extremism and violence, um, incitement to organized crime. And all those things are happening and are real. And yes, we have to be very conscious of it because they are a challenge to the, the, the use of of digital communication of the internet, but they're also a challenge to democracy, and they're also a challenge to human rights of everyone in the world. And I think this deals with the final question that you made, which is what to do with the next generation. In many countries, there was also uh, a talk about not allowing children to use internet because it's too dangerous. In some countries, they say don't allow women to use internet. Um, I think the solution does not lie there. The solution is what are we doing to make sure that the use of internet is well developed. For us in UNESCO, for instance, one of the priorities is the media information literacy programs. Because we really believe that we want to build critical minds, whether it's to deal with media, what we want to call fake news, I don't like the term because it is not news. It's if, you're, if, you're, you're, if you're building uh, a campaign on, on false premises on purpose, it cannot be considered news, and this is being done. But it was done in the past in different ways. It was done with gossip or it was done with 
So it was done with other methods. It goes broader. The same problem. We do have to just use of internet in a positive way. In UNESCO, there was one director, Mr. Federico Mayor, a few years ago, that established the concept of the culture of peace. Amongst all the cultural elements we have, we have to build the culture of peace, which is a culture of understanding, of sharing values, of respecting different, different ideas, different cultures, different religions, and different nationalities. And this is crucial. Uh, or, or, or the uses of mobile technology and internet through mobile technology. We have had great experiences in youth violence prevention in many parts of the world. I come from Central America. We have been doing this in Central America. In, in parts of Africa, and we have in the Mediterranean, we have a wonderful program called NetMed, which is specifically for young people, how to share their perspective, their views, and how to prevent violence. So we must understand how within all the dangers, precisely these technologies of communication can help us have a policy of prevention. But this the role of the communities, of all those engaged in the development strategies of, of internet, of all those working on, on eGov, uh, as you all are, to begin talking about this. And yes, as the friend on, on cybercrime was mentioning, yes, some cases can be a case of regulation, which is every criminal use of, of information, child pornography, are considering or over. Uh, and uh, the work related to develop new technology. The reason was that the top officers were dominated by five members of Security Council. And these members of Security Council and UNESCO did not have the required scientific knowledge. They were mostly senior politicians and did not know what to do. Thank you very much. It, it, uh, may, it, may, it, I ask you, may I ask the point of your question, if I may? Yeah. But uh, and I need to. The has Mean there is nobody who can identify the problems of electronics of rural people and rectify by using technology to manufacture any computer. Yes, please. Uh, Pavan Dugal, President CyberLaws.net and Advocate Supreme Court of India. Frank. Uh, from your address, two points emerge. Security regulation now coming in different parts of the world. Do you see that as a threat to fundamental freedom of speech and expression on the internet? And number two, with now Darknet coming more and more center stage on the 10th anniversary of the IceGov, is it time for governments to start about having presence and operations on the dark web? Thanks. Thank you. Yes, I saw the lady raising the hand behind, please. Thank you. I identified the absence of the language on access to justice and brought it back into the global spectrum. I was a little surprised to see, and maybe it will come in the future, that when we talk about e-governance, e-government and service delivery, the one area that has not really been touched on in these sessions is the justice sector. More efficient. I'm hopeful that this will be rectified in all ISCAF conferences in the future because this, along with, you know, we talk about education and health, but if you don't have access to justice, you cannot access any of the other services mm. either. Very good question. Thank you very much. Frank, over to you. 
But let me just say in the outset that thank God uh, uh, UNESCO has really no link to the Security Council. I think the Security Council is very important and it does play an important role within the United Nations. The purpose of the Security Council is to maintain peace, but from a different perspective, looking at zones of conflict in the world and finding negotiated solution to the zones of conflict issues through of individuals. I must say, and, and again, not defending UNESCO, I think UNESCO has done wonderful things, uh, and, and sometimes we are open to criticism as well. This is valid. But it's to establish, to help state authorities to establish the right policies. More than doing investigation for new inventions or new apps, for instance, this, we believe, should be done by the researchers in every single country, in every single state. But our role is how to build that into policies that will benefit or uh, research. And this is e exactly our, our priority, which I think is important to, to mark. Cybercrime and regulation. I think we need regulation in some areas, like I said, there's some elements that can be regulated from a human rights perspective, and I insist on this because of the to regulate Article 20 of the ICCPR, the idea is, yes, there can be limitations to freedom of expression, and this includes uh, expression over the internet, when it harms someone else's uh, rights. It, there can be some limitations for national security, public order, public health, and public morals, it says, or when there is an attempt to harm someone else's reputation. But very specifically, when there is incitement, to discrimination, hostility, and violence on the basis of race, nationality, and religion. Today we see a rise again in the world of very hostile language trying to mark the differences between race, between nationalities, and between religions, which is very tragic. When we have to find the common ground as human beings and not the difference. And this is a danger that should be, that should be applied. Now, this brings us to one debate that has constantly occurred, is that there are clearly no international standards. There are principles in UNESCO. We had the, we had the Connecting the Dots conference and the, the room from roaming principles were approved and should be always seen in the optic of multi-stakeholder dialogue, which is very important for defining the policies of internet. But, the, these are principles to be applied around the world, but I have not seen an element of regulation and there is at this moment in the world a reaction to have uh, elements of common, uh, of common regulation. Who knows, for instance, the crime of child pornography or the crime of genocide and incitement to genocide becomes a corollary. So yes, there are international crimes that are already standard, but beyond those individual cases, Talking about regulation as internet is complicated. Now, on the last question of the access to justice, I'm very glad that you mentioned this because it enhances freedom of expression, yes, but it also enhances participation. It enhances transparency and it enhances access to justice. And this is why goal 16 is trying to put them together because they are linked and because all of them are necessary for development. So yes, I would totally agree with your affirmation that without access to justice and due process of law uh, in, in all society to be able to and apply the internet policies. Well, thank you very much. I understand that many people want to raise more questions and continue this kind of discussion, but I have to conclude this session for two reasons. One is the airport and the minister, chief guest, has already arrived. So the, I thank you very much for your very high level question and then the big bow to Frank. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. IceGov 2017, New Delhi, India. Come, shape the future with us.